Welcome everyone to another episode of the Donnie Podcast. We're here with Brendan Chisholm and Mark Abramovich. Brendan is the founding member of BKC Holding LLC. It's a private equity real estate firm focused on acquiring distressed and value add large multifamily and mixed use communities. So we're going to be talking with Brendan today about his journey through real estate and uh, where he is right now. We have Mark Abramovich, the lender, on the call as well. Uh, he's going to be giving us some insights as well on, on this episode. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Doing good, Craig. Great okay. to be on with you guys. And Brandon, a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, Mark. And thanks for having me on the show today, Craig. I'm looking forward to uh, enlightening your guest. No problem. So, Brendan, uh, let's start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your real estate journey and uh, how you got started. Sure. I got started about five, six years ago, uh, attending my first uh, multi uh, real estate meetup. And at first, I was all about climbing the corporate ladder with my current job and finding passive you know, real estate income. So I started looking at turnkey single family homes in the Southeast and um, thought I wanted to do that because all I wanted to do was continue to get promoted within you know, whatever company at, at the time I was working for. Um, attended my first meetup and one of the gentlemen there uh, started talking about the power of the cap rate in multifamily and I was hooked there afterwards. Uh, so spent the next you know, two, three years consuming as much information, education, pod podcast content as as humanly possible to to figure it out took his course and you know started making offers on deals um what was your I, tell us about your first deal what was that like so the first deal uh purchased in february of 2021 it was a 53 unit apartment complex in noonan georgia uh, was asked to be part of the GP through a fellow friend because you know, him and I were both talk throughout COVID. We're talking nonstop of what, how to structure real estate deals, how to raise money, all of that fun stuff. So got asked to join the GP, and we closed on that deal in February 2021. And you know, 53 units, nine units were down. 14 additional units needed to be renovated at the time. Um, and this was before rent growth went astronomical. And you know, through so you know. Came in, did the renovations, got got the entire thing leased up pretty quickly after the, the nine units were back online. And by the time the property got stabilized and we were going in for a refi in September of 2022, um, you know, we were 40% above where our underwriting numbers were. Um, so yeah, that was that was our first real estate deal. Um, yeah. So it worked out pretty well, uh, at least through the, um, the value add um process of it and the execution risk so, okay. you know, so just stepping back here to just a little bit we i know a lot of our listeners they want to get that first deal they want to step up from smaller properties to larger properties what how is the um offer process or the analysis process different for these larger multifamilies, or is it pretty much the same <sighs> We try to make it more complicated than it actually is, but it, it, in reality, <laughs> it, it's it's the same thing. It's just it's just more numbers that you're working with and making sure to. We underwrite on a month to month basis to understand what our occupancy levels are going to be to make sure that we have enough in reserves to be able to you know, make sure the property can pay the bills, pay the mortgages at the end of the month. Um, so it's. You know, the, the only difference, though, Craig, is we were using float, we used a bridge loan on our first deal, which is you know similar to like a hard money loan, but that was floating rate debt. So like, you know, SOFR at the time or LIBOR, uh, it was LIBOR at the time was close to zero, and there was a spread on top of it. So you know, we had interest rates of you know mid fours at the time, which sounds extremely cheap, but that was um, in 2021 more expensive than when you were typically getting from your agency debts. Um, you know, going through the underwriting process, you know, we typically aim to find a 15% IRR on our deals, uh, you know, with a return of capital, uh, at the refinance, uh, within the first two years, not all of it, but, you know, a, a good portion of that amount of money being returned back to our, um, to our investors, um, the underwriting process and the analytics behind it is, you know, we have spreadsheets that we've been using or been able to, you know, 
create ourselves or just take from other people and figuring out you know, what do we think, what what do we realistically think rent growth is going to be for what is currently renting at the market, where our property is, and then looking at what you know, what what outdoors amenities we have versus the rest of the competition. What is you know, what's our square footage versus the rest of the competition? What's like the unit mix? You know, this one was all two beds, one bath. Um, so we were going in, we were doing you know, stainless steel appliances, uh, granite countertops, nice stone, shaker white cabinets, uh, you know, all of the trends that you find on Pinterest and your real estate journals right now and design journals, we were, we were putting those in and uh, it, we provided a, a nice rental for, for people at the end of the day. Um, so we, we look at, you know, we look at comps and making sure they're achievable for what's what else is in the marketplace. So usually we try to find something where we're still positioned below and the numbers still make sense on the deal. OK, so, Mark, I'm going to bring you in here just mm -hmm. uh, from the financing aspect. Oh, Regarding God. these larger deals, I know you've done done a ton of financing for these type of deals. But what what can our listeners expect to be different when financing these larger 50, 100, 200 unit complexes versus uh, a four unit so um if truthfully it's not my arena that's that's already bigger <clears throat> um just in general i think uh lenders in general will want to have uh people with experience uh so not not so much on the subject of uh, financing but on the subject of the uh, you know, the people who are guaranteeing the loan or who are the principals actually running the project, what lenders will look for is experience. Uh, stepping up from a single family deal that you've done, right? A single family house somewhere, jumping up to, um, you know, 53 units, uh, there's going to be one, there's, they're going to be looking at what's your past experience, right? What are you capable of doing? So actually, I would love to hear from Brendan, you know, what he went through uh, with financing this. So there were six other guys. There was a total of six GPs, including a KP that we, we brought on to the deal because you know, five out of the six people. Can you hang on? Just one thing, Brendan. Yes. We don't know the level of listeners. So uh, okay. can you explain the terms? Sure. There is a general <laughs> partner. So a general partner is somebody who is an active participant in the managing of the asset of a large syndication like this. There's limited partners, which are people who typically passively invest into into deals and don't have an, any active, um, mm -hmm. aside from the money that they put in, there's no active, they don't have you know, much activity yep. within the property. A key principle is someone who can guarantee a loan. Um, um, Mark, you might be able to speak a little bit more in detail with this, but what lenders typically look for on large multifamily deals is uh, an individual or a collective general partnership where their net worth is equal to the amount of debt that will be put onto the property, yeah. as well as income on a monthly basis that can cover debt payments in, in case something it goes into, you know, go, something goes haywire. So this is just a way to make sure that the the general partnership team is on sturdy financial, uh, yeah. has a sturdy financial base to be able to service the loan. No, our, one question, our, our, Brendan, did you have to, did you, did one of your partners have that financial wherewithal to personally guarantee these? these yeah. So that's why we brought on a key partner, key principal for our deal, the KP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he has a bunch of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac experience, which you know, help bolster our experience with the lender itself. So it, it made for a more, I'm not saying seamless because, you know, majority of the people were still green around the years, uh, but it definitely helps, um, settle any un, unsettled nerves within ReadyCap when ReadyCap was the the um, the lender that eventually gave us the money for gave us the debt for the deal. Now, I have a question. You mentioned DSCR, right? So the debt service coverage ratio, yeah. which is your cash flow versus, you know, what the mortgage payment will be, right? They, mm -hmm. they want to make sure that there's enough uh, income coming in to cover. Was there a ratio they were looking for, such as a one you know, DSR, DSCR of one or a 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 yeah, it was, it was, it was low two, one. There's two things, Mark, that they look for. It was the DSCR at one as well as a debt yield. And debt yields, oh, I'm going to pull this up as we speak right now to make sure I'm not providing uh, wrong sure. information to the listeners. Is uh, It's a risk metric for commercial and multifamily loans. It can be determined by taking a property's net operating income 
you know, your income minus expenses and dividing it by the total amount. And we needed it. We had money being swept into a lockbox where they uh, we were now getting very granular in the terms. A lock. Uh, there's a soft lockbox and there's a hard lockbox. Um, the hard okay. lockbox, which we had on there, is our lender and asset manager at the time would sweep away all of the excess cash flow into this lockbox. And we had to hit these debt yield metrics in order to be able to release uh, any additional cash back to the property. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the big thing that we're seeing, Mark, is uh, particularly when it comes to these type of you know, bridge loans, when we were doing our first two deals, we needed to hit certain debt yields before we could sweep cash from there, as well as occupancy levels, or mm -hmm. we would have to hit these debt yields and be able to go into additional tranches. You know, a tr mm -hmm. So I'm getting into my second deal now, which we're, we're going through. We have a $2.15 million CapEx budget for the deal in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It's a 70 unit deal down there. Okay. At first, they would they, we had one point six million dollars in our tranche one, and then once to get into tranche two, we had to hit a certain debt yield metric, which was six point five percent. So, what is the property's um, net operating income divided by the total lo loan amount to be able to release the rest of those funds? Yep. And that was another key thing when we were able to sweep all of the cash from the lockbox and be able to start making distributions because the property, A, you know, that yield, we hit our metric and B, we were at 90% occupancy levels. Wow. Thank you for that. I mean, that's a, that's a great, you know, description and, uh, you know, overview of uh, how, you know, the cash gets uh, moved around and released for these bigger projects. Mm -hmm. And the typical thing, too, when you're looking at a debt yield, as well as a DSCR, if your DSCR has to be one, you can't be necessarily going into some of these bridge loans, which is like in for, for a residential list, you know, for the residential investor, a debt yield is kind of like a hard, uh, sorry, a bridge loan is similar to a hard money loan. And you can mm -hmm. lever up on these hard money loans as well as you can lever, you can lever up on these, these bridge debts, but in order to hit some of these metrics, we'd have to be able to bring in more money, you know, more equity to the deal. So we're not going in, we're not, you know, our LTC loan to cost, which is your, your purchase price plus your, your, your renovation, yeah, yep. renovation, all that. You know, typically you can go up to 80% on a, or 80% or higher on a, a bridge loan. Mm -hmm. we are, we're, we're still going in for some of these deals. We're still going in with an LTC of like 65 to 75%, which is not necessary to do to meet the requirements. However, it de-risks de our deals because yep. we have more equity into it. And it, it allows for lower payments on a monthly basis that we would have to send back to. Uh, it, it just reduces your debt payments at the end of the yep. day. Right. Okay, so Brendan, how is this structured from a, <clears throat> like from a, let's say we wanted to get into some of those deals or you have your partners, how do you, how do you structure the, the payments in, let's say you have a deal you want, you want to pool, someone has, that wants to invest, how would you, how would you go about doing that? So we, all, the deals that we do are heavy value add for the most part, heavy value add, value add deals that, you know, the one, the, why I say distress in Noonan is because based off of occupancy levels, it was, you know, 70, mid seventies percent when we purchased it. So what we offer to our limited partners, people who want to invest passively into the deal is a, what we call a European waterfall model. It's, you know, it's just a fancy names that, uh, the private equity people have, have come up with. But in short, it's like we offer seven or 8% IRR and you know, equity splits there afterwards. So for you know, the equity split is like the profit share at the end of it. So if you invested $100,000 into one of our deals and there was an eight, you know, we, our pref was 8%, in order for us to be able to get into the profit split, Craig and Mark, what we, what we would have to do is if, if it's year two and we're getting into the profit split, we have to return $116,000 back to you. So you have that 8% IRR and you have no capital at risk at that point in time. So mm -hmm. for us to be able to get into our profit split, you have to have no capital outlay in, into a deal. 
Um, with a heavy value add like we do, we don't typically state that we're going to start distributions until the end of year one you know, for, our, for our Rock Hill deal. We told them, you know, it's probably going to be closer to 18 to 24 months just due, due to the size of the, the renovations that we're doing. Once that occurs, though, it's, you know, we, we typically go into we'll, the exit stra- or the, the business plan is bridge debt to agency debt, you know, your mm-hmm. Freddie or Fannie Mae's of the world. And then that at that point in time, it's much more attractive debt that you're able to put onto the deal. So then you start cash flowing and being mm-hmm. able to release distributions. We do it on a monthly basis uh, back to your investors, you know, for at some points in time, you know, it, it just varies based off of where, how much cash flow the property is spitting off. Do you intend to, um, <clears throat> so what's, what's the plan? Well, so let's talk about your, uh, your deal, your first deal, right? The 53 units, you mentioned you had six GPs, one key principal, right? Mm-hmm. How many uh, limited partners did you have? 42. Or was it just the seven of you? I'm sorry. 42 limited partners, 42 limited partners. All right. 42. That's it's a lot of K ones. It's a lot of K ones, but <laughs> Hey, I, we didn't have the you know, enough money to be able to buy it. And, you know, we're, we're going through our phones asking people if they want to invest. Um, mm-hmm. we had to raise over two and a half million dollars. And for six people who were doing their first indication together, we wanted to make sure we could close and do that. So yeah, it's a lot of friends and families, a lot of you know smaller checks at this time, just to get people in there and say, Hey, we have a proof of, we have a business plan that we feel strong about. Mm-hmm. This is a great alternative investment. If you know, for people who are, who are you working, you know, work their nine to five and they're very good at it. And they're not typically your nine to five workers. These are people working eight to six, they're working long hours and they don't have the time to be actively investing in it. So yeah, it was 40, I think 42. Mark. Um, so yeah, that's phenomenal. It, you know, we, but we account for this when we're underwriting our deals to Mark and Craig, um, the, every single month we have a line item in our budget for, you know, close to $7,500 worth of accounting, uh, yep. that we have to do. So $7,500. Wow. Yeah. Uh, tell us how that deal went, uh, Brendan, if you can, like wh- how, how is it going now? What's are you sure yeah they're still being done what's how how are the distributions looking now so uh, we how did it go 18 months we within the first 18 months we were able to start lining up within 15 months we were able to start lining up our refi our, the refi with uh with fannie mae took three months there afterwards but you know, this was when this is interest rates start just started to rise and whatnot but uh, that's another story um, <laughs> we in lump sum we were at the time of the refinance we were able to return all of our investor capital back to our investors um, so if you invested a hundred thousand dollars you no longer have any money at risk at this point in time and we have reser- we have enough money that we were able to take out as well and put it into reserves to make sure the property still ran. So you know, we're doing monthly distributions on a, you know, we're doing monthly distributions, everything there. It's a little, it's less than what we were originally doing prior to uh, making mm-hmm. the return of capital, but you know, there's no money at risk for any of our investors uh, right now, but all good things don't continue Sorry, to go. Let me just stress that again. You're 18 months in. I, I just want our listeners to truly grasp this part of it. 18 months in, the investors have no more capital into the deal. That's correct. Everything that's coming out now is gravy. Everything we're not we're not at the profit split yet, Mark, but yes, everything else is just additional money that they're getting mm-hmm. sent to them on a monthly basis. Yep. And and what is that what does that work out to like on a percentage wise it's like four high fours right now depending on you know, a hundred thousand dollar investors getting about four hundred dollars a month mm. okay so it's it's it, it, although it's like yeah it's high fours it, it's an infinite return at this point in time yeah yeah because they don't have any money into the deal they can yeah. you know put that hundred thousand in another deal if they wanted to which, correct which surprisingly our third we, we lined up our third deal almost perfectly yeah <laughs> almost like you planned it 
Just like we planned it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work out just like that, Mark and Craig. It, it we we close we refined the deal like two weeks after we closed on our deal in um in our third deal in Virginia. Um so mm -hmm. we it, it was one of those like we it was a fine balance of like you know there was close to two and a half, three million dollars of money coming in, but we can't tell a lender or the seller that, hey, you know, our money's not gonna be here until our refi happens. No, this is like we just we had a set le we had a level set expectations with our investor network as is like yeah I'll save you a spot but you have to put money in mm -hmm. and then we'll return your money back in like two to three weeks there afterwards so it, there was some you know it, it required if our investors wanted to put that money back into it some financial engineering on their behalf. I do have two questions. Uh, I I don't know maybe I well I don't think it, you mentioned it. If you don't mind, just the top level, what the purchase price was and what your rehab amount that you were uh, planning on was initially. Okay. So, and then in terms of, uh, you know, you, you just mentioned having the money coming in in two to three weeks, but you couldn't tell the lender and the seller. I would like to know if there was a difference in negotiation because part of kind of um, part of the real estate world you know, sometimes you do have a case where, especially in the residential world, where you're selling a house in order to buy another one. And so it's understood that your purchase is contingent on a sale. So okay. mentioning to a seller that, hey, we're going to have a refi being completed in two to three weeks is not horrible. I mean, it might co come at a cost. I'm just curious what the negotiation was like. So if you don't mind telling our listeners about the uh, kind of top level numbers, Sure. And then additionally, the what the negotiations are like. Sure. So top line numbers on that deal in uh, Noonan, Georgia, four point two million dollar purchase price on 53 units. So we were at. About just under eighty thousand dollars a door, we were planning mm -hmm. to do 23 units uh, of renovations, plus a bunch of exterior work, and we were doing about 20 plus thousand dollars for each of those units, maybe more. Okay. So you're looking at, you know, $500,000 of CapEx um, for the interiors, plus an additional $250,000 that we initially set aside to do um, for exterior work as well. Costs started to go through the roof, plus, plus we, there's a building, there's a two, all right, so there's a defunct office space at this property that also has a, a funky three bedroom light layout. So <laughs> we were able to like we worked with a zoning attorney based in Co Coweta County, which is the, the county in which our the assets located, and we mm -hmm. got approval. We we got approval to be able to build to build a 54 unit within the 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 property itself. Yep. So we were all in, you know at the end of it, it was like close to $900,000 worth of CapEx. Okay. That cost us about $200,000. That was a straight ex equity play. So we're our all in basis, Mark. Mm -hmm. We're about, we're just under, we're just about 5.2 if you include closing costs, yep. whatnot. So okay. $5.2 million closing costs. When we went in for the refire evaluation came back at $9.2 million. <sighs> What are the average rents there for this property? We were underwriting to a thousand. We're currently achieving twelve ninety five. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Um. So, second to answer your second question, mm -hmm. um, we didn't change any around, anything around with the negotiations with the seller. We told you know this the sellers gave this the deal in Virginia, which is our mm -hmm. third deal. It was off market. We were the only ones to be able to, you know, we were the only ones doing the deal. He didn't want to hear, hey, I, he wanted to close mm -hmm. in September, in mid-September. And whatever we had to do, we were going to do that. So yep. luckily, as we build up, you know, as we build up a track record and being able to do this, you know, the, there's four, there was four of us on this deal. We were able to raise two and a half million dollars or just, you know, we, we were able to raise the two and a half million dollars for mm -hmm. our to close on the deal. Okay. So we, I think we needed like 
and don't quote me on this, just under $2 million to close. But the rest okay. of the money that was coming in was going to be, we, we raised money to have, we thought we were, this is September of 2022. We thought we would have to put down 50% equity, mm -hmm. 40% down payment to be able to achieve it. At the end, at the, like the last minute, we were able to get terms from a, um, terms from a local community bank where we got five and a half percent debt for five years. So at 75% um, LTV plus the 75% CapEx that they would cover. But we mm -hmm. raised money on top of that to be able to have all of the money ready to go and not tap into like that line of credit as well as just having additional, um, as well as uh, having additional money as working capital. So nothing withheld us from closing on that deal. Mm -hmm. And there was no changes in the negotiation. We, we, we felt confident to be able, we had the money to close when the money needed to be there and be wired to the bank to do it. So no, no material changes okay. on that. I was just wondering like what the difference is. And you kind of mentioned it, that the seller wanted to close mid September and he didn't want to hear anything about anything. So right. the, the answer's there too. <laughs> you got to close. You got to close. Okay. Okay. Um, so, Brandon, what are some of the uh, things you look for to kind of boost the value of these complexes? What do you think drives the most amount of value when uh, doing these, these these repairs and value adds? We're changing. You know, we're, we're buying properties that are in the path of progress, Craig. Um, so there's a large delta between what we're what the current market rents are and what the the market for you know a you know, b minus asset is so what we're going in to do is we're upgrading kitchens we're upgrading bathrooms we're upgrading the interiors we're doing dog parks we're doing laundry we're doing stuff for outdoor amenities to be able to make sure like we're targeting the right demographic there you know, to be able to move into our apartments eventually and you know we're trying to create a community and provide housing to families who want that you know who are not ready yet to buy a house and being able to provide them 2023 into or 2022 whenever we buy 2023 interior renovations on a you know a 1960s and 1970s asset so you know it's it's a lower price point but you're still getting some of the night you know some of the nicer interiors uh in the property so our kitchens look fantastic our the work that we do, you're putting in ceiling fans, putting in, you know, tubs, reglaze, putting in new floors, every, you know, all of that. I think that drives some of like some of the behavior as to why people say, have that wall factor when they walk into our apartment communities. Right. And uh, what in the 19, 1970s, quote unquote, asset, what are they paying rent now when you acquire it versus after you renovate? Uh, depends on what market that we're in. Um, in uh, Rock Hill, South Carolina, it was like 800 bucks at the time. Uh, and now we're getting rents on average of about 1325. No, oh, it's almost double there. Yeah. It's great. That's great. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Brendan, if someone wanted to invest in, in, in the next deal, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. You can give me a call on my phone number, 978-835-9376. Happy to talk, have that relationship because I I do mostly 506Bs right now. And I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. tell, I'll tell you about the difference right now. 506B allows sophisticated investors, people who are not considered accredited, accredited by the SEC is somebody who has a million dollars net worth or successive years of $200,000 plus income or a joint $300,000. So I open it up to my family and friends who do, do not necessarily have that million dollars of net worth to be able to get in there. So I, I need to make sure I have a relationship with you uh, prior to you investing into a deal. So give me a call, shoot me an email, brendan at bkcholding.com. You can visit my website, brendanchisholm.com or bkcholding.com. I'm on all of your social uh, platforms, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, I run a meetup in Fairfield or in Stanford, Connecticut. So anybody who's in the tri-state area, it's the first Wednesday of every single month. Um, love to have you. Uh, you know, we're growing the audience down there and growing, growing the network. So that's great. And I also host my own uh, podcast as well, the Value Add Real Estate Show. So you can jump on as a guest or you can give it a listen. Uh, any of those, feel free to reach out and uh, love to have a conversation about real estate with you. 
Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, Mark, any any comments? Yeah, for I've got I've got a, I've got I've got more questions actually. <laughs> I don't I don't know what Brandon's uh, time is, availability is, um, uh, but I, I have a different question also. What yeah. did you do before this? What's your background, right? Um, for for those listening and are thinking, oh my God, you know, I would love to get into this. How do I get started? Um, you've mentioned, you know, the numbers, you listening to what's, uh, what people are doing out there and, you know, getting an education, but what's your background? Where did you start, right? What did you do before? Still doing. So I'm still doing, okay. Still doing. I still have a nine to five. Um, and my nine to five, I do business development for a telecom company. So I'm in, okay. I'm in sales for that. Uh, and then prior to that, I was doing program and operations management for numerous, you know, fortune 500 companies, uh, since I graduated 14, okay. 15 years ago. Um, so there's a lot of transferable skills in which you can have from you know, being yep. able to add value to this. Uh, I have, you know, I'm halfway decent with numbers. I can you know, write a deal out on a, on a napkin, but I'm, you know, I'm efficient in Excel as well. So, uh, it's just reassigning my time, like re focusing my time on just doing this. And this is what I wanted to do. Um, ever since I heard of, you know, the glory, the power of the cap rate. And you know, <laughs> I just, I just doubled down on it. I, you know, I bet on myself and you know, here I am a few years later. And hopefully Brandon, explain that to our listeners, the power of the cap rate. You mentioned that twice <laughs> already. And that's sure. a very powerful concept <laughs> for you. Sure. So, uh, give our listeners a brief overview of the power of the cap rate. The power rate. of the cap rate. The great thing about multifamily and commercial real estate is they'll trade based off of what people are willing to pay for a property. So if you're buying something in, let's say Stanford, Connecticut, you're looking at a typically stuff trades around 5%, like a 5% cap rate. And that's essentially a multiplier as to what, what people are willing to pay for the amount of income that is coming into the property. If you invest in Hartford, some of like, you know, not, not saying downtrend areas, but like, you know, typically, you know, older vintage properties, you, you could be paying a 10 cap, which is like a 10 times multiplier. Um, so if you add a hundred thousand dollars worth of net operating income in a five in a property that has a five cap, mm -hmm. that's two million dollars worth of additional equity that you were able to add to the property. By adding a hundred thousand dollars of net operating income, you add two million dollars of equity, and that equity goes to you your general partners, as well as your limited partners. And it's a life changing thing. And that wow. is the huge difference, by the way, for our listeners between five plus properties and one to fours, mm -hmm. one to fours are cost basis, five and up, you're starting to play in this income based approach. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a great way. It's, it's how you add value. So you, you see the work that you're doing and you, you, you know, not just from, uh, being able to create wealth, there's actual beauty in what we're doing too. You know, I, I say real estate is the perfect combination of beauty and capitalism because you're, you're taking, you know, an older design and you're bringing it up to modern standards and there's ways in which you can capitalize on this, um, but, but also more importantly, you're providing housing, you know, uh, something that is in dire shortage of in the United States and making sure people can come in and you know, raise a family or you know, have children or just get out of school and have a nice roof over their head. Mark, you had some other questions before I interrupt. No, that was it. No, that was it. I had, the, I had the question about the numbers and I had a question about what uh, Brendan used to do before or now still and he mentioned that in the fact that it's transferable skills um and you know that's something else also i think our listeners should uh, take into account yeah. whatever it is that they do now we all have skills that we can bring from one industry from one part of our lives to another and so i thought i'm, I'm glad that uh, brendan mentioned it right you don't uh, and you don't need a silver spoon to be able to do this you just need hard work and a head on your shoulders and knowing that you you can you can solve problems. Mm -hmm. So, Vernon, what are some of the team members you need to have in place to do something like this? It's trusted general partners, people that have experience in the marketplace, people who can underwrite deals, people who can you know uh, raise capital, who have time to be able to uh, asset manage deals as well. 
then you need people you need a key principle which i explained earlier somebody who's you know, you're willing to give up a percentage of the equity to be able to use their bank statement or their your their experience and it, it, it's a critical thing mm -hmm. um you need you, since i'm based in stanford connecticut and i invest in the south you need trusted property management companies um, you need good relationships with lenders you need you need to network and you need to find everybody um to be able to do this it's it, this is a team sport at, at the heart of it because it's if one person cannot do this if you do you're going to be burned out within the first three months so uh just making sure you build out a proper team and making sure like you're the team that you're building is you're you're pushing forward with everybody's strengths and hiding other people's weaknesses you mentioned uh, property management Huh. since the, that's the business Craig uh, is in, uh, property management. Do you have on site or do you have a, a company that you hired that's not on site, you know, to manage the asset? And did you find them first or the asset first? So the property management company is not on site. The properties that we own right now, that I own right now, aside from one but we don't have a leasing office we don't have on-site personnel we share resources with local with property management companies that have local uh, they manage multiple properties within the market or close mm -hmm. to the market that they're doing so we can share resources making sure that you know their maintenance people can come from one property to the other as well as their leasing person is you know, is a hybrid between both of the properties uh, okay. we found the deals we were looking we were looking for the deals plus contacting property management companies throughout. at the same time okay yeah, yeah. Very so cool. you know, brendan what, so what what do you would you say are the biggest lessons you've learned on this journey you're on your third or fourth deal now i think I'll, you said i've done third. four deals so far four deals so far large apartment complex investing what are some of the key takeaways you you've learned along this journey particularly in the capital raising space, Craig, it is not easy to raise money, especially regardless of your track record. And just like sales, you need to understand how to win fast and lose fast because people don't necessarily want to invest with you. They could be your best friend in the entire world, but they have other, they have other things going on at that time that they can't put in money. So you just need to be able to say, you know, you get to put personal relations aside and make it make sure it's still a business. Um, you know, it's a humbling factor to be told no thousands of times for people who who you're trying to invest with them, and then uh, you just build up that track record, and they, they, hopefully they'll they'll come around. So you can you're not going to have the biggest network of people who want to invest with you immediately. It comes with time, just like real estate. You know, it's a it's a get rich slow scheme. Or with with your track record, you just got to have a proven track record be, as you continue to have these conversations. Uh, secondly, uh, you got to you got to go down to the asset a, every other week and have eyes on it. You know, that that's a big thing, and that's why we have you know, our team of general partners. There's you know, four to six, and the deal in Alabama. There's it's a JV deal, but there's a total of seven people on that deal. It's going in and out of the property to make sure you have eyes on it throughout the entire thing. Um, because nobody's going to love your baby as much as you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's, that's a good point. Well, and then be transparent. Tell every, especially because you're taking on people's money. You gotta, you gotta tell them the good, you gotta tell them the bad and you gotta tell them the ugly because you have a fiduciary responsibility and people are entrusting you with their money. So make sure you are fully transparent or you're never going to have anybody again, invest with you. Yeah, I know. I know we had talked about some of the challenges you had gone through with with switching property management. Can you share a little bit about that that experience? Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, prop, we've transitioned property management at two of our properties. Um, in twenty twenty one, we had, this was the deal in Georgia, and that's the one that we moved to a new property management for. They were doing great at the onset. Um, you know, we everything was going well. There was a bunch of tailwinds that were at our back, and operationally, we didn't really. Operationally, everything just worked out. That like, you know, in, we were hitting, we were above underwriting, we were all of this stuff, and then we started to hit uh, some tailwinds or some headwinds at that point in time, 
and the property management company that we were using quadrupled in size and you know their their resources were stretched extremely thin so we made the we had we mutually with the property management company we mutually agreed to part ways um we since onboarded a new property management company in uh our georgia asset and they have you know what we learned is you know as great as this is it's nice to have people with local experience that i you know i just mentioned being able to share the resources so everything is you know, we're getting back to normal operations at that property um the one in rock hill i wish i could say the same uh so the people that were managing our asset in uh noon in georgia also wanted to expand their footprint in charlotte north carolina they just didn't have the resources to be able to effectively manage it and when they when we you know, mutually agreed to part ways at the georgia property we also did that in uh south carolina as well so we had in, in south carolina we had a transition away from their their construction arm as well as onboard a new construction management team as well as a new property management team uh about 45 days after that <laughs> um yeah it's not really a laughing matter but it, it, it you, in retrospect i like to laugh about it uh, the regional portfolio manager for the new company that we brought on took a new position at a, another property management company in another market and that property management team told us that they could no longer manage the asset so within a 75 day period we, we transitioned property management companies twice and we are finally back on you know the straight and narrow However, that didn't excuse us from doing our due diligence as general partners to be able to augment, you know, any any hiccups in leasing activity because we're you know we're mm -hmm. stabilizing these properties. The general partnership took a much more active role in you know follow up from apartments.com, you know, creating our own social media pages to be able to drive traffic there, having the conversations and alleviating some of the the workload that would fall onto our community manager at the time and be able to make sure we were one of the ones doing the, the constant follow-up as they were you know putting out fires around the rest of the property oh very very interesting yeah so that's great that you guys kind of took <laughs> took more of an active role and kind of filled in the gaps where yeah. you know where necessary to to you got to property succeed you have to do it because you know if, if this was your if this was your own property or if this is still a property where you're syndicated, it's you're still it's still affecting it. So you got to do everything within your power to make sure you get back on the business your business plan. I have a different question, slightly uh, changing t uh, tracks. Uh, raising capital, you mentioned the five hundred six B fund, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that you know Craig asked you about uh, the team members that you needed to have. So you've got the GPs, the limited partners, the the, the key principal, right? Property management. How did you have your paperwork set up for, uh, or who set up your paperwork for uh, the fund? We worked with a securities attorney. Uh, okay. Well, we have a, we worked with one securities attorney that was a referral. The next, mm -hmm. so they draft a private placement memorandum. A private yep. placement memorandum is essentially a subscription agreement, subscription offering, telling you here's what could go wrong with the deal. And that covers about 50 of the 55 pages. And the last five pages are here's, you know, here's the general partnership team. Here's, you know, here's what the offering is itself, but it's essentially a way in which, um, people understand that there's risk involved with every single investment. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is just something that you need to sign to be able to say, I understand the risk that are involved with it. I also understand the upside. So we have now, you know, after going nothing wrong with our securities attorneys, they were more transactionals for deal one and two for deals three and four. Um, you know, there's a, there's a gentleman who's a local securities attorney who lives a town over for me, who mm -hmm. I was friends with prior to it. And okay. he works out of New York City, and he's he now helps me form all of my operating agreements, my special purpose vehicle LLCs, any of mm -hmm. these. When I go do deals, he's the one I, I consult with, and he puts everything together to make sure that everything is kosher and registered with the SEC. Mm -hmm. Okay, if if you don't mind, I'll I'll talk about this. Uh, I have some more questions. So I run, I operate a five hundred six B fund as well. Okay, that I raised uh, specifically for lending. Gotcha. And same thing. It was a way for friends and family to invest. Uh, just to give our listeners an idea of overhead, right? So we we talk about costs. In my case, it was about fifteen thousand dollars of fees to have this set up. Mm -hmm. 
And if you don't mind me asking on the first and second deal, let's say, what was uh, your cost? $15,000. How much? 15,000. 15,000. So exact same number. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is just, uh, again, this is for our listeners to take away some key points, right? That there's certain overhead that comes with deals. And especially as you get into larger deals, right? We, we discuss, you know, the huge upside that's available with, um, value add on multifamilies. And there's also certain, uh, overhead that comes, right? Appraisals are no longer $800, <laughs> right? Inspections are no longer 350 from a local guy, right? Uh, we're talking about $15,000 just for the uh, syndication paperwork for this. Uh, you, Brandon, you mentioned $7,500 a month, I believe, was your accounting cost? Uh, six, yeah, $7,500 for the year. For the year? Yes. Okay. I thought for the month. Okay. Which still wouldn't be a <laughs> right. You know, totally insane either. But okay. So for the year. So just, uh, t you know, that's um, for everybody to kind of get a perspective of yeah. uh, fees involved in these uh, deals. Right. And th that's a very good point, Mark. And you need to make sure that the numbers still work when you add these additional costs yep. into the deal. Because there, this will, you know, between making sure that the deal, you know, making sure you have all these co costs accounted for could change the IRR from a 15 to a 14 or it could right. change it from a 13 to a 12. And like, that's when, if you, if you don't account for it, you're just, you're misrepresenting what the actual cost will be to close. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of IRR, can you give uh, our listeners or uh, a quick uh, kind of like two word, what is IRR in a, you know, kind of plain language? Plain language, uh, it is an internal rate of return. So the time, it's a metric used to estimate the profitability of a potential investment based off of the time horizon of the investment. Okay. So basically everything you earn, let's say if the time horizon is five years, everything you've learned over five years divided by five to give you the annualized rate of return. Yes. And how's that, Brandon, how's that different from the, from a cash on cash return? The cash on cash return is you know, what you're getting on a monthly basis from the cash flow of the property. Uh, this, the IRR is more of like a discount rate that makes the net present value of all cash flows equal to zero and a discounted cash flow analysis. So does the IRR take into account the, uh, any liquidity event refinance or, or it, it can. Yes. Okay. okay. So like your IRR could look, I mean, we, if we sold the deal in Noonan after you know, 18 months, we would have been at like a, a 50% IRR, but now like they were holding it longer, it's going to go down to like, you know, high teens, you know, low twenties once, we're, once we're done with it. So it's just how long you want to hold the deal because you can, it, it's, there's no perfect metric in financial analysis. This is just one that we typically use to, because some of the people that we do are sophisticated. So this is just something that they're looking for and understand, you know, based off of a five to 10 year hold, here's what my, internal rate of return should look like. Okay. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank Sounds you. Good. All right, Brendan, it was great having you on. Um, Thank you very much Greg. here and, uh, you know, we're going to share your, your links so that everyone can, um, can check you out and check out your deals and, and, uh, and, you know, potentially call you, become your friend first, and <laughs> invest, <laughs> invest in one of your deals. So thanks. Thanks for joining us. Mark and I on the Donnie podcast. And, um, you know, we'll be sure to touch base again. Appreciate it. Thank you so much okay. for having me. You're welcome. Meeting you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.